Well, good morning, everybody. All right. Now, what's my name? I'm just kidding. I'm totally joking. <laughs> totally joking. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity for humility for myself. I love when people don't know my name. So thank you so much for that, brother. Um, let me just get this set up here really fast. It is so good to be together with everybody this morning um, and worship God together. That song we just sang is actually one of my favorites. Uh, I just, I'm sorry to the people in front of me and around me because I was probably belting it out. Okay, let's see if this is up here. All right. There we go. Okay. So to get us started this morning and just kind of introduce our thoughts, has anyone here? Okay, we're good. Thank you. I appreciate that, though. <laughs> has anyone here ever had to prepare to meet somebody? Maybe it's a big job interview, or maybe it's a first date, or somebody who is a big name to you and really important to you, and you needed to prepare to meet somebody. Uh, I, I'll just tell you for myself, that can be really nerve-wracking sometimes. So just for example, on Caitlin and I, our first date, we had called each other, we had texted each other, but we never actually met each other in person. And so I was pretty nervous. I was worried I wasn't going to be able to hold a conversation. And for about the first 10 minutes when we were driving, I was just talking about the trees we were going by. And I mean, it was fine. It worked out okay, but it, it had a lasting impact on me, but, but it was nerve wracking. And so when we met, it, it gave a lasting impact on me. It still does. Or the first time that I came here to preach a sermon or the first time I met with the elders, that's pretty nerve wracking. You don't know if you're going to get grilled. You don't know how people are going to be. You want to connect with people. But after I met all of you all and the elders here, it's had a great impact on me, and it still does today, absolutely. Um, and so I'm willing to bet that, that most of you here have probably had something like that. It can be pretty nerve-wracking depending on the situation and the person. And it seems like to me that the more important somebody or something is to you, the more nerve-wracking it can be. So it seems like the higher the stakes are to you, the more nerve-wracking or the more anticipation you have. So then along those same lines, my question this morning is, what would it be like to meet God. Do you think that would be nerve wracking? Do you think you'd need to prepare? I think so, absolutely. And there's a bunch of different directions we could go with that. But this morning, what I would love to do is go to a passage of scripture where a group of people met God on a mountain. And the details here are colossal. It was a massive, really important event that was much more important than even a first date or preaching at a congregation for the first time. So if you'll open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19, please. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. It's the second book in the Old Testament over there on the left of your, of your Bible there. And just to give some context and where we are in the time period, God had led the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. He, I mean, the, the Israelites saw some amazing things happen in Egypt. The 10 plagues, unbelievable demonstration of God's power. God led them over the Red Sea on dry ground, parted it, amazing demonstration of God's power. God had been leading them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Amazing demonstration of God's power. He had been providing bread on the ground, manna. He provided water in desert places. Uh, he had done so much for them, even gave them quail. Amazing demonstrations of God's power. But up to this point, we've seen where God has taught the people to observe the Sabbath day. We've seen where God gave instructions about the Passover. But up to this point in Exodus chapter 19, God has not given what we would probably call the law of Moses. God hasn't given it up to this point. So in Exodus chapter 19, we're going to read the buildup to when God is going to give the law. So if you're in Exodus chapter 19, it's going to be a great place for you to be. We're going to be here for the majority of our study this morning. And then on the second half, we're going to go to the New Testament. But Exodus chapter 19 right here, let's start with verse 1. Let's read the first six verses. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they sent out or set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. 
and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So three months after God had led Israel out of Egypt, three months, it says to the day right there in, in verse one, they come to the wilderness of Sinai and they camp in front of the mountain. Moses gets called up by God to the mountain. Moses goes up there and God tells Moses to tell the Israelites, I want you to tell them, you all saw what I did in Egypt. You saw how I led you out. And I, it says here in verse three how, or verse four, how I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. And so now he says, if you will listen to my voice, if you will obey my covenant and keep my covenant, then you're going to be, what does it say in verse five? You're going to be my own possession. You're going to be a special people. Although he says the end of verse five, all the earth is mine, but you're going to be my special possession. You're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If you will just listen to my voice and do all that I say. So let's see what happens next. Verse seven, verse seven. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words, which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around saying, beware that you do not go up the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. He said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So after God says, I want to make this people my special people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Moses comes down from the mountain and tells the people, all the elders, he says, this is what God has said. And we see what their reaction is down there in verse eight. It's a great reaction. They say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That sounds great. That's a great reaction for them to have. So Moses goes back up the mountain to God and he tells them all the words of the people. And God says, okay, so here's what you need to do. For, for two days, you need to consecrate the people. They need to wash their garments. They need to abstain from physical relations. They need to be ready for the third day. Because on the third day, the Lord himself will come down on Mount Sinai. That's pretty big. That's amazing. And so God, he, he tells Moses these things. And he says, I'm going to come, verse 9. He says, I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud. And everyone's going to hear my voice. He says, the people may hear when I speak with you and that they may also believe in you forever. So God also wants to give Moses more credibility for all the people, but also himself. Everyone's going to hear the voice of God. And so by God giving these instructions to the people, he says, you need to consecrate yourself for two days and be ready for that third day. There's already a clear distinction between God and between man. You can't just waltz up and meet God. You've got to prepare yourself. And so they've got two days to do that. Further, God gives extra warnings. He says, set bounds for the people that they don't touch the mountain. Because if somebody touches the mountain, they're going to be killed. If an animal touches the mountain, they're going to be killed. So even before God himself has come down on the mountain, because God is going to come on this mountain, if you touch the mountain, you're going to be killed. And just further emphasizing this difference between God and between man. There's this big difference between the two, between the mountain, what's about to happen, and common earthly things. So let's keep reading here in verse 16. So they've been consecrating themselves for two days and we get to verse 16. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. So it's the third day. Remember, God said, be ready for the third day. 
It's the third day and it says it's the morning and there's thunder and there's lightning and there's this thick cloud around the mountain and there's this really loud trumpet sound going on. And the end of verse 16 says that all the people who are in the camp trembled. This was a powerful, awesome, and amazing demonstration of the power of God. And I love verse 17 because it says, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Moses brought them to meet God at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18, it says, the mountain, the entire mountain was up in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And it says the smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain, the entire mountain quaked violently. So just imagine that you're seeing this. It's early in the morning. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's really loud trumpet sounds. The, the trumpet gets louder and louder. Moses says something and God responds with a voice or a sound like thunder. This is powerful. This is an amazing demonstration of the power of God. Amazing demonstration. So let's keep reading here and, and see what else is, is here. Verse, verse uh, 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and he told them. So when Moses comes up to the mountain, I mean, just imagine you're Moses and you see all of this happening and you go up the mountain to meet God. It's insane in and of, in and of itself. But Moses gets up to the mountain and God says, go back down and you tell those people again, don't you touch the mountain. Don't you come up here, don't you look at me, or many of you will perish. It says that right there at the end of verse 21. He says, also, make sure the priests have consecrated themselves. So if there, I mean, if there was anybody who you would think would maybe be allowed to get on the mountain, it'd be the priests, right? Well, God says, make sure those priests consecrate themselves, and they can't come up either, or I'm going to break forth upon them. And then again, uh, down here in verse 24, we actually see where Aaron gets to go up the mountain with Moses. Aaron does get to go, but that's a little bit later and a little bit different. So he says, do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord or the Lord will break forth upon them. So there's this really clear separation between the mere holiness and power of who God is on the mountain and the people. There's this separation where if you touch the mountain, because God is so holy and powerful and awesome, if you touch the mountain, you're dead. I don't know if you'd be vaporized on the spot, but that's what it seems like. <laughs> the holiness of God is too big for words. And it's been demonstrated here. Don't touch the mountain. And so in, in the next couple of verses here in, in chapter 20, in verses 1 through 17, we see a, probably a similar passage to us. We call it the Ten Commandments where God gives the, the Ten Commandments to the people. But I want you to remember this. Remember that God had told Moses back in chapter 19, he tells him in verse nine, he says, I'm going to speak and everyone is gonna be able to hear me. Everyone will hear the voice of God. So imagine again that you've seen all of this stuff on the mountain, the thick cloud of darkness, the thunder, the lightning, the, the trumpet sounds, the thunder, the entire mountain is shaking violently. And then you're going to hear the voice of God. Do you think you'd be primed to listen to what God had to say? I think so. And really quickly, let's just scan chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, the, the Ten Commandments. This is what God says. Verse 2, he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and mother. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. So again, do you think that these people would be primed to hear this? 
For two days, they had to consecrate themselves. They washed their garments. They abstained for physical relations. They see what's happening on the mountain. The whole mountain's quaking violently, thunder, lightning, thick cloud, all of this. And then you hear the voice of God say these things. What do you think your reaction would be to that? I mean, this is amazing. This is an unbelievable display of the power and holiness of God. Well, well, let's look at what the reaction is. Let's keep reading here. Chapter 20, would you read with me in verse 18, please? Chapter 20, verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and saw the, mo the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. So when the people, they perceive and see all of this in chapter 20, verse 18 says they trembled and they stood at a distance. They knew all well and good what we've talked about all along the way that God is holy, he's all powerful, he is different. And then when God speaks, they beg Moses, you, you talk to us yourselves, but don't let him speak to us. Because if he talks to us, we're gonna die. The mere voice of God on top of everything that they're doing, the holiness and power of God that is on display, we're gonna die. Don't let him talk to us or we are gonna die. And so Moses goes up the mountain and he becomes that mediator for them, the go-between. Moses talks and listens to God and tells the people. And we could keep reading. I mean, I love this. We could just keep reading this. This is amazing. We, in verses 21 through 24, God gives the law. God gives the law to Moses. But I think this is an amazing encounter with God. And it's so vivid that I don't know about for you, but for me, this is something that sticks with me. I remember this one. Um, and, and this is what it was like for Israel to meet God here. And I also think that maybe today, if you were to ask some of your religious friends, or maybe if we're going to be honest with it ourselves, if we were going to talk about what we think it would be like to meet God, it might be a little different than what we read here. I mean, especially if you've watched any of the Christian movies or, or shows or, or read any of the Christian books, sometimes when, when people meet God, it's no big deal. It's just kind of meh. Sometimes people don't even know that it's God. They don't even recognize everything about him. He just kind of looks normal, looks like a person, nothing different at all. And that's just not what we see in this text. And I would even go so far as to argue that if you look all throughout scripture, when people meet God, it's, it's a big deal. They know it's demonstrated in power and you can see that in their reaction. And so this morning, I really want to notice some things in this text about what it was like for Israel to meet God on this mountain, sort of from their perspective. The first thing is that God wants to be close. If you're an Israelite and you hear that God himself is going to come down on this mountain, this physical mountain that you're camped in front of, God wants to be close. God reminds them in Exodus 19, verses four through six, he says, remember how I brought you out of Egypt, how I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. And it's almost like God is just imploring them, if you will just listen to my voice and keep my covenant, you're going to be my special people, my special people. You're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And, and God wants these people to be close to him. Uh, and, and God himself comes down on Mount Sinai. I mean, we can't even emphasize that enough. The real God of the universe himself comes down on a mountain to be with his people. That's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. God wants to be close to his people. And so when he gives the, the Ten Commandments, the first four at least are all about his relationship with the people and the people's relationship with him. God wants his people to be close to him. It's, that's an amazing thing in and of itself, but that's not it. If you're an Israelite, you need to be ready to meet God on this mountain. You need to be ready uh, to be in the presence of and, and meet God. The people had to consecrate themselves. They couldn't just waltz up lackadaisical or no big deal. This was a big deal. They had to prepare themselves. They were told to wash their clothes, stay away from physical relations for two days because they were going to meet God. And notice that they had to be pre-warned, don't touch the mountain. But before God even comes down on the mountain, he says, don't touch it because I'm going to come there. Don't touch it. If you touch the mountain, you're going to die. They needed to be pre-warned that if they or an animal touches the mountain, they're done. 
They needed to prepare. This was going to be a massive event, not lackadaisical in any form or fashion, not meh. This is a big deal, really, really big deal. And so you don't just waltz up on God like it's no big deal. But also, if you're an Israelite, this is a really important one. You realize your inadequacy. If you're an Israelite and all of this is happening, you realize your inadequacy. So before God even comes down on the mountain, the very fact that you have to consecrate yourself and change some things from your everyday activities to meet God just shows that on your own, you're not enough. Because if you just waltz up, like it's no big deal to meet God, you're going to be vaporized. You're, you're going to be killed. They had to consecrate themselves. And then when God comes down on the mountain, they really realize they're not enough. Again, just remember all of these things that they saw in Exodus 19, verse 16. It says that they trembled. And, and uh, God, God told them again, don't touch the mountain. Don't come up here. Don't let an animal come up here. If you do that, you're going to die. Don't do it. And verse 18, it says they trembled and they stood at a distance. And again, in chapter 20, it says they stood at a distance. They realized something about God was so much greater than them that they were not enough. And, and in Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, they beg Moses, don't let God speak to us. Because if, if he does, we're going to die. We are not enough on our own. We're not. And so they recognized that they were inadequate. And this is something interesting to me. A thought that I had about this passage is, do you think that this is the fullness of God's power on display here? In, in other words, do you think that God had nothing left in the tank after showing all of this power? I don't believe that for a second. And I appreciate several of you were doing this. That is great feedback for me. I don't believe that for a second. So that means just a portion of the power and holiness of God on display is enough to make people fear for their lives, is enough to make people realize I am not enough. This is so much greater than me, just a portion of the power of God on display. So they're not, they're not enough. And because they're not enough, they realize that they need a mediator. Remember, they said, don't let God speak to us or, or we're going to die. Moses, you do it. They needed a mediator, someone to go between them and God so that they wouldn't die, so that they would be okay. Aaron was actually able to go up as well, but we see that Moses is just different. Moses is different in his relationship with God and being able to go back and forth uh, between the people and between God. So the people realized they were inadequate compared to the holiness and power of God, and, and they needed a mediator. And so they had Moses, who was a mediator. So this is what it was like for the Israelites to meet God. This is what it was like. And I don't think any of us in this room have had this same kind of encounter I might be wrong. I don't think so. And I don't think that we will on this side of eternity. Um, and so we haven't come to Mount Sinai. We haven't. We haven't witnessed all of these things that the Israelites did. But can I just share something with you this morning? We haven't come to Mount Sinai. We haven't seen these things. But we have come to a mountain. We have come to a mountain. And I'm really excited to share this with you. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we have not come to Mount Sinai, but we have come to a mountain. And I think what we're going to realize is that the mountain that we have come to is very different. But these same principles that we have on the screen behind me are the same. So Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to end with this. <clears throat> and in, he, in the book of Hebrews, the writer has been contrasting the law of Jesus, or I'm sorry, the, the law of Moses with Jesus and has been saying that Jesus is so much better than the law of Moses. And specifically, when we get to chapter 12, uh, the writer is encouraging the Christians here. He's writing to Christians. That's going to be really important. Uh, he is encouraging them to endure the suffering that they already have and the suffering that they're going to endure by focusing on Jesus. And here, he's going to contrast Mount Sinai with a different mountain. And so I'd love to read this together. Go down to verse 18, please. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 18. <clears throat> Talking to Christians here, the writer says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. And so I hope that as we've read those verses right there, it's very clear to all of us that he's referring to Mount Sinai, right? This is the events that we just read about. 
And the writer here, he says, you Christians, you haven't come to that mountain. You haven't come to that mountain. And he's going to tell them the mountain that they have come to. So look at verse 22, please. But you Christians have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And so the writer here is saying, this is not a physical mountain, but the writer says that Christians have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion, some people view Mount Zion as being heaven or someplace in the future that one day Christians are going to be there, but that's not what the writer of Hebrews says. Did you see that? He says, you have come to Mount Zion already. You've already come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, and to God. And so what that means is that if you're a Christian right now, you are on Mount Zion right now. And what's amazing about that in verse 23 is that God is there. You are on the mountain with God. Do you see the difference? At Mount Sinai, God is on the mountain, but don't you touch the mountain or you're going to be vaporized. But now for Christians today, the writer of Hebrews says, you have come to Mount Zion and God is there. And why can we be on the mountain? Verse 24, because Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel where the Israelites had a physical mountain that they couldn't touch, they couldn't be on it with God. Christians today, in, in Hebrews and now, Christians today are on the mountain with God because of the blood of Jesus. And it is unbelievable. It is so amazing. Think about it. If you touch the mountain, if an animal touches the mountain at Mount Sinai, they're dead. But you and I, if we are Christians, we can be on the mountain with God right now. That's too good. It's too good. And, and the point that the writer of Hebrews is making here is that Jesus is much better than the old law. Because think about Mount Sinai. That's where God gave the old law. It's better because we have Jesus. So let's keep reading here. Uh, based on that fact, look at verse 25. The writer says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, to those things which cannot be shaken, or I'm sorry, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we Christians receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. So the writer of Hebrews says, because you Christians have come to a different mount right now, that's better because of Jesus. You need to be careful. He says, see to it that you don't refuse him who is speaking. This is a much better way than them. So you must be careful. Do not refuse him. Um, and he says, these verses mention that Mount Zion, it's not some physical thing that can be touched or shaken, as we see here in verses uh, 26 and 27. But he says, this kingdom, Mount Zion, cannot be shaken. It can't. Can't be shaken. And because of that, we ought to show gratitude by which we can offer acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God as a consuming fire. So if you really want to know what's the brass tacks, what do I do with, with this lesson this morning, it is, it's what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 25, where he says, do not refuse God. Do not refuse him. Because he calls us today into a much better way than he did with Israel. And just think about how amazing Mount Sinai was. But the writer of Hebrews says, with Jesus, it's a much better way. It's a much better way. Do not refuse him. And then further in verse 28, he says, show gratitude and serve him with reverence and awe. Reverence and awe with gratitude. For our God is a consuming fire. We saw that at Mount Sinai. And if you're not on Mount Zion right now, God looks like a consuming fire. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we may not meet God in the same way that the Israelites did, but the writer of Hebrews says we have a better way. And we're on a better mountain, and that's Jesus. So I really hope this morning that studying these scriptures has made God seem bigger to you, because it certainly did for me. God is so much bigger than, than even we can think. And it's only through Jesus, the mediator, that we can access the Father. And so again, although we may not meet God the same way that the Israelites did, can you just look at this list again? Can I say that God wants to be close to you? God wants to be close to you today. 
so much so that he provided a way for you to be close to him so that you can be on the mountain with him right now and when we die. God wants to be close to you, but we need to be ready. We need to be ready right now in this life. We also need to be ready for the next one because if you're on the mountain now, you're gonna be on the mountain when you die too. It's amazing, it's great, but we need to be ready. But also to meet God, we have to realize our own inadequacy, that on our own, we are not enough. There's no amount of perfect law keeping or checking all the boxes or doing all the right things that can make it right because none of us have ever done that and none of us ever can do that. We are inadequate on our own. We are completely. And because of that, we need a mediator. We need somebody who can go between us and the Father and make us right, and that's Jesus. We just read it in Hebrews 12, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. It's, it's Jesus. And so this morning, if you're not on the mountain because you don't have Jesus in your life, I implore you to change that. Whatever that change might, might be for you, I implore you to change that. Be like, uh, I want to say what the writer of Hebrews says here, do not refuse him because we are offered such a, a better way with Jesus than the Israelites were on Mount Sinai. And we are offered that better way right now. So if that means becoming a Christian this morning because you want to be baptized, we got water, we'll do it right now. We're, we'd be happy to do it. Or if you've become a Christian before, but the power of Jesus in your life, or maybe you've stepped off that mountain, I just implore you to make it right. Whatever your spiritual need might be this morning, you have an opportunity right now to make your life right with God. While together we stand and while we sing.